Okay, everybody ready? More or less? Okay. I hope you all ate your brain food this morning. It's hard to keep up with George. We're going to do our best. So. Um, welcome here to our psychos meeting. And welcome to our psychos. <laughs> like, likewise. Okay. Uh, so I think if everyone's ready, we're about, we can just get started. So okay. this is Dr. George, and uh, he'll be talking today. I'll be trying to make sense of what he says and write it down on the board <coughs> in a structured way. Okay. And then, uh, Less you're not structured. Yes. No. I'm not. <laughs> so by. 1.30, we want to kind of stop the questions. 1.30? It is. It is 1. You know what I mean. Anyway, I will stop when I stop. So. Okay. Okay, everyone ready? Good. So, thank you all for coming. Uh, today I'm uh, interested in talking about the topic about which I really don't know a whole lot. And I hope you will help me figure out, and I really mean it, literally. Uh, what I'm interested in, in, this is a kind of psychological talk about self and no self. Uh, I thought in this day of uh, pathological ego, it would be fun to talk about whether egolessness, lack of ego, is pathological or not. But really what I'm going to talk about is the self and no self. But I'm not going to talk about from a metaphysical point of view, but much more from a phenomenological and psychological point of view. I'm going to talk about the sense of the sense, the various sense of self that we have and what may happen when this various sense of self gets, gets disrupted and how that, whether this has any bearing on Buddhist practice or not. Now, I should say that I have, I'm not a psychologist at all. Uh, I, have, I'm, uh, I have no knowledge about psychotherapy and the psychology. Uh, what I'm really trying to be is a philosopher, a Buddhist philosopher who is interested in trying to find what some of the most important teachings of Buddhism might mean in modern terms. And what I've been particularly interested in is trying to see what happens when you put Buddhism and cognitive science, psychology, in phenomenology, in conversation. What is the interesting uh, overlap where there might be difference, what does Buddhism bring, what does cognitive science bring to the table. That's really what my interest is. So this is what I'm going to talk about today, particularly as it bears on uh, the self. Now, <coughs> uh, I guess everybody is quite aware that self is a very important topic in Buddhism because one of the fundamental insights of Buddhism and actually of Indian yogic traditions is that it is our sense of it is our sense of self. It is a project that we engage in that is of self-making which binds us to suffering. And that's I think a fundamental insight of Buddhism, but in general of Indian yogic tradition. Not of every Indian philosophy, that's why I use the word yogic but you find similar insight in Sankhya, Vedanta, and so on. And sure, there are differences between these schools, in a way, but I think as far as the fundamental insight of what's the relation between <coughs> suffering 
self and freedom, these schools actually have very, very similar views. So this is what I want to talk about today. It's about the self or the sense of self uh, that we have and what happens when this sense of self is disrupted, right? So, and I, and I want to bring in, as I said, not just Buddhist, but also cognitive science because uh, one of the things that cognitive science brings to the table is the understanding that the self or the sense of self that we have is not just an obstacle, as Buddhism makes it to be, but it does thing for us. And I think when you bring the two together, you have a much more, uh, a much richer understanding uh, of what is the role of the sense of self in, in, in human beings. Because Buddhism uh, says that it's an obstacle, and it is, but on the other hand, it would be quite, I think it's quite one-sided to see just as an obstacle, because I think it's also, our sense of self is also something which does a lot of things for us. So if you bring the two together, I think you have a much more complete uh, picture, and that's what I want to bring. And also what I want, in a way, is check, what I'm interested in is checking what is Buddhism really talking about? And I think cognitive science brings to the table a series of concepts and terms which help us, I think, to understand what Buddhism is trying to do. So I think that's what I'm going to try to do. And then uh, I hope that you have a lot of questions and suggestions and reactions because in a way this is a topic which is quite new for me and which has not been explored by too many people. Uh, I think the first person that I remember talk, writing about that is Miriam Bahari in her book Analytical Buddhism. And then late nowadays, uh, there is a psychologist at uh, Brown, uh, Will B. Britton, who is uh, doing a lot of research about that. And I owe to both these people uh, uh, so a lot of insight that, uh, uh, about this topic. But this is a topic that is, I am in the pro process of exploring, and uh, so are the two people that I just named. Okay, so, uh, <coughs> now, when we talk about the self, as I said, I'm not really going to talk about the self from a metaphysical point of view, like, is there a self or not? This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, when I talk about the self, what I'm really talking about is a sense of the self that we have. That's what I'm talking about. So I'm talking about phenomenologically, philosophically, not metaphysically. I'm not talking about whether there is a self or not, because we would get in a terrible fight. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not what I'm going to talk about. So <laughs> you want to start the fight? <laughs> like Atman is not, the question of Atman is not what you're talking about. Right? Uh, yeah, we, we don't need to. <laughs> that's the self, right? Yeah, but that's metaphysical. Are we talking about the personality? No, we're not talking about personality. We're talking about the sense of self the sense of who we are. Yeah, this is not personality. Sense of self. So I'm talking about the self, if you want, from a phenomenological or from a psychological point of view, right? Yeah, exactly. So there is no question of whether there is a self or not. This is not what we're talking about. We're just talking about what is the sense of self that we have and uh, what are its different levels and what are the sense of self doing for us and what happens when they are undermined, removed or something like that. And then how is that uh, different or similar to Buddhist practice? That's what we are talking about. Now, when you look at the cognitive scientific uh, literature about uh, the self, uh, you can see that 
there is a great deal of, I wouldn't say confusion, but diversity. People talk about three cell, people talk about five cell, there is up to 25 cell. So this is, you may think it's confusing, but it makes sense, at least from a Buddhist point of view, because obviously the Buddhist view is that our sense of self is not, is something constructed. And so it gets constructed in a variety of ways. So there can be three self, there can be five self. Uh, it all depends what is the context you're thinking about. So here, what I'm going to talk about is three level of uh, self formation. So that's, <laughs> yes, thank you, sir. Sorry. Uh, okay, I'm not sure that what the difference is. <laughs> <laughs> there are two levels of whiteboard. <laughs> I, yes, I know, but I don't know which one is higher and lower. So, minimal self. Minimal self. And remember when I'm talking about uh, self, I'm not talking about whether there is a self or not. I'm just talking about our sense of self, right? Minimum self, core self. Narrative self. That's for real. OK. So what I'm talking about is different ways. Yes. I see. Okay. So, so you're not planning on sitting down, right? So. Well, I guess I'm not, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So what I'm what I'm talking about? Remember, I'm not self in terms of what there really is. What I'm talking about is a sense of self that we have, right? The sense of ourselves that we have, okay? Now, <laughs> if you, when you ask the question, who am I? Uh, the most obvious level is probably this one, the narrative self, right? I am a Swiss man, yeah. a boring professor, <laughs> so on, Buddhist and all that, okay? That's what people call the narrative self. That is, is a self that uh, we construct through narration. And it's a sense of self, of myself, as it extends over time, right? Like, I was a child in Switzerland. Yeah. And then I grew up, I went to India, and so on. Remember, I'm not talking about the self as it exists. I'm just talking about the sense of self that we have. And there is a sense of self that I have of myself as having been a child in Switzerland, uh, a young man in India, a boring professor in the US, and so on. That's what we are going to call the narrative self, right? Now, many people in the cognitive science literature and in uh, kind of modern Buddhist philosophy argue that it's in fact all what the self is. It's a purely narrative, right? For example, my friend Mark Sidritz argues that, uh, a much more famous person, Daniel Bennett, argues that, and so on. So there is a lot of discussion about narrative self, right? Meaning the construction that I do about my own sense of who I am through narrative, right? Yes, and narrative self is a kind of construction which allows me to bridge large gaps of time, right? Okay? So story. Well, story in the broad sense of, uh, of the word, right? And I think it's a very Sorry. It's a very uh, important way in which we understand ourselves, but obviously story in the broad sense of the word, right? So why would that be 
personality <coughs> for me, uh, I'm not going to, to use the word ego. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was just a joke for the sad time we are into these days. But uh, what I'm talking about is sense of self, different levels of the sense in which the sense of self is operating, and. Uh, I want to differentiate between personality in the sense, for me, personality are more about habits, right? Yeah. So, for example, I know some people, no name will be mentioned, who are incredibly short-tempered. That's a personality. <laughs> <laughs> you will find out. <laughs> Uh, no name mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Just put it on Twitter. <laughs> no, quick one. Is the narrative self what some psychologists would call the whole sense of identity, a self identity? Yeah, when people talk about identity, they are multi mostly talking about the narrative self, right? You know, I'm Swiss, I'm Buddhist, I'm this, I'm uh, socialist. All these things are the narrative, the way we construct our uh, sense of who we are, right? Through narrative. And I would think that narrative self, uh, narrative self is also very important uh, in terms of our sociability, right? Narrative self is what allows us to function in society in relation to other people, right? So this is a very important construction. construction. Uh, remember, we're not talking about whether there is a self or not. We're just looking at it phenomenologically, that is, from the way in which things appear to me, or if you want to say psychologically, right? Narrative self. So this is a very important sense of self. And in fact, you're right. If you ask, if people talk about the identity, it's mostly narrative, right? Because core self is not going to give you a lot of identity. OK? Now, uh, for example, if you say, I'm a man, it's not sure whether it's probably divided between narrative and core self, right? But most of how we think about our identity is in function of, uh, is in relation to that kind of construction which I have uh, labeled uh, narrative self, right? And narrativity is something which allows us to structure uh, our s to structure who we are in relation to long period of time. And that might be a distinctive character of human beings, or at least of primates. Because, for example, I would be, it's not sure, but to me it looks like to a narrative self is uh, a self which requires actually considerable conceptual resources. So I put it out as a question, is it unique to human beings? Maybe, maybe not. Certainly it's not the sense of self that is uh, happening early, very early, when the baby is born. That sense of self is gradually constructed uh, throughout life. Maybe it starts before language, maybe when you have what they call joint attention. So that's maybe when it starts, but certainly uh, when it develops later, uh, you can see that language, or, and more specifically, narrativity, meaning the ability to narrate, to understand one's life or the life of others as a narrative, right? Uh, that ability uh, relies quite importantly on language. Did you have a question? I think you resolved the issue okay. of saying okay. that the narrative self is related to the social experiences. Yes. That's very important, right? Uh, because we think of our sense of who we are is just proper to us, right? But in fact, there is a whole level at which uh, that sense of self is actually co-created with other people, particularly our parents, but not only. Okay.
Now, as I said, many people think that this is basically all what we need to talk about self. And I guess I don't agree because I think there are deeper sense, more minimal sense of self which are operating and which are very important and very important to understand Buddhist practice. So, below the narrative self is what I've called the core self or the, you could call the stable self. That's a self, <coughs> okay, suppose you have Alzheimer's terrible disease. People who have Alzheimer's are not able to uh, understand who they are. But they're still able to function at the minimal level to go to, to, to the table, to go to the bathroom, and all these things. So that sense of self which is operating there is what I call the core self. It's a self of uh, embodiment. If you think I own, I am the, I own my body, right? That sense of self who owns his or her body, that's what I call the core self. That sense of self does not depend on language. It's not. It provides absolutely minimal identity. But it is a sense of self on which, on the basis of which. I operate in the world. Uh, Tibetan text uh, has an interesting description of the four selves. I mean, that's not how they talk about it, but I think that's where it amounts to. They describe it as a head merchant who is leading or controlling the boss of the merchants, right? So I would describe the core self as the CEO of the mind-body complex uh, in as much as we uh, uh, act uh, on a daily basis. Not when we think about uh, who we are, uh, I'm a conservative, I'm a socialist, not that kind of action, but the kind of you know, basic action that we are engaged in all the time, uh, that sense of uh, being control of the, of the mind-body complex, that's what I call the core self. Now, the core self, uh, as far as I have seen in the literature, probably emerges very, very early in life. Probably in the few, first few weeks of life, you, up to two, three months perhaps, you start to have a core self which develops. And that core self is important at least for two things. One is to coordinate uh, various sensory inputs. The other, probably more important, is to distinguish uh, self-issued uh, self action from other imposed action. So what apparently happens is that the baby learns how to distinguish the action that he or she herself is able to initiate from the actions that other people makes her do. And it is this ex set of experience which uh, creates this much more basic sense of self that I'm calling the core self. That sense of self I would assume must exist in animals, at least in mammals, probably in birds as well. Right? That's a sense of self of uh, I am in control. Obviously, there is no verbalization right? of my action. Right? Turns out, in reality, we are not in control. A lot of control, but I have the sense that I control my actions. Right? I have the sense that I'm the owner of my body. Right? That sense of ownership, of owning one's body, that's at the core of what I call the core self, or the stable self. If you think about emotions, 
uh, probably there is a strong difference between, uh, there is a difference to be made. For example, if you think about fear, that probably, physical fear probably has a lot to do with this core self, right? On the other hand, if you think about shame, pride, that's probably more to do with that, right? Because this shame, pride, and so on implies a kind of social self, right? That the core self is not social. The core self is a self that exists prior to the process of socialization that the baby is undergoing. Yes, sir? No. The evolutionary psychologists would say that the fight or flight syndrome. Yes. Right? Yes. So, but that seems to fall in between all the marriage self and core self. No, no, it's here. Yeah. Core self completely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, in the brain, everything is interactive, yes. right? So, uh, what I make this three level of sense of self, three level of self, uh, this is obviously a heuristic. Uh, distinction because in reality things are completely interacting, right? But you can, it's useful to make this distinction uh, to understand what, for example, what I'm going to talk about, it, what goes wrong when these different sense of self are, are disrupted, right? So if you want to say analytically, uh, it is useful to make this distinction, though in reality in the brain, there is so much interaction, right, and interconnection, that actually they, it's, it's going to be hard to distinguish what is, what is operating at which time and at which level, right? But I think it is useful to make these distinctions. So, so, so far, core self, narrative self, is a, so narrative is the most superficial level in the sense it's the most conceptual one. Uh, core self is obviously much less conceptual, though I still think it is conceptual in some way. Uh, okay, last one, minimal self, right? Uh, what I would call the minimal self is the simple fact of subjectivity. The simple fact that I am here, that something is going on for me, I am seeing something that's experience of seeing is happening to a subject. So that's what I call the minimum self, right? Uh, for example, if you think about the experience of space, uh, the way uh, I experience space is that space is in relation to me, right? That sense of being for me in relation to me, that's simply the fact of subjectivity, right? The fact that I have a subjective experience, which is not your experience. You see the room differently from what I see. That's simply the m most minimal level, and that's kind of what I call the minimal self. Presumably, uh, fetuses for, I don't know, a few months old, have this kind of subjectivity, right? They do experience sensations, and in as much they have sensation, that sensation is happening to a subject. So this is what I call the minimum self, right? So you can see that there are these three levels at which, uh, or three levels at which the sense, sense of self is operating, or three distinct uh, sense of senses of self, because we think that the sense of self, that we think self is unique, right? But in reality, when we look about how our sense of self, we can see that it's just a kind of phantom, which is com constantly resetting itself in order to coordinate the different parts of our mind-body complex, right? So that's why you have three levels, but you could have four or five because it's constantly uh, res resetting itself. Yes? Can you relate the minimum self and sense of subjective experience to the scandals? I'm just curious as to what 
No. Relationship or not? What are the scandals? Yeah. The, the so aggregates. He asked what the scandal, scandals the body. The aggregates. Aggregates. This is why I call the mind body complex. Okay. okay? Uh, what the Buddha called, or oh, sorry, what the, the Pali canon described the Buddha calling the aggregates, right? Uh, okay. Kanda. So how do you relate these three selves to awareness? Okay, okay, okay. So <coughs> the owner of the aggregates uh, is the core self, right? Even though it could be a subject experience. Yes, awareness. As soon as you have awareness, you have a, a point of view, right? And the awareness of awareness? awareness. Well, that's a whole different. We'll not go into that, but uh, that's where it happens. The awareness of awareness, if you want to say that's part of the meaning, that's what it means to be a subject, meaning to have an experience which is happening to you, not as a self, but just as a perceiving, experiencing something. So awareness would be here, the, the word is upadana kanda, right? And uh, upadana means, how do you translate? Uh, grasp. grasp or appropriated, right? So uh, this mind-body complex is what is appropriated or what's grasped or what's owned by the self, right? Yeah. Uh, you were first. Uh, the minimum self is that. Minimal. Minimal, what it's like to be me. Yeah, what it's like to experience, right? The experience. Yeah. Sometimes they call it the witness, right? Yeah. The bare, bare fact of experiencing, and presumably that bare fact starts even before you're born, right? Yeah. yeah. It's interesting to me that uh, the memory system in the fetus is fully developed structurally at 18 weeks. Mm -hmm. So you have 18 weeks gestation before uh, before birth. That that system is in order. Whether or not we're utilizing it or can utilize it, we don't know yet. Yeah. But at least on a physiological level, it's, we're potentially getting experience from 18 weeks that will then move into the core cell. Yes, the core cell happens after you're born, when you, yes. when you start to experience basic sense of agency. Instead of story, you should really write identity. Because story <laughs> sounds like yeah. too superficial, but yeah. identity is really what we're talking about. Right? Love it. OK. Love it. Yes. OK. Yes. So, yes. so would you say this? He doesn't. State of this solution of, aware oh, we, of awareness of awareness. We're not there yet. <laughs> we're not there yet. This is all I'm just talking about <laughs> yes, three senses of self. Okay, so now what happens when this sense of self, uh, when things go wrong with this sense of self, right? So that's what I'm going to talk about. And then I'm going to uh, ask the question how this Buddhist practice different from this? pathological meaning disease states, right? So, narrative self, what can go wrong? Uh, so I'm going to uh, make a, a totally made up typology in which you have a light uh, disruption or a much heavier disruption, right? So you're going to have to... So for the sense of narrative self, uh, I guess something like identity crisis or depression might be connected to the sense of, uh, of uh, the narrative sense of the self. I remember that when I stopped being a monk, I was completely depressed and completely disoriented in a way that I was totally surprised because I thought, you know, uh, I, nothing has really changed. But sense of identity is something very uh, powerful, and when it gets disrupted, so I think something like depression, some depression, might be a light disruption of the sense of narrative self. Heavier? Well, something like dementia or Alzheimer. Alzheimer is, a is the state in which the person has 
Yeah, lost all sense. <laughs> See? <laughs> the source own sense of identity. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> okay. So with Alzheimer's and things like that, this is declarative memory. This is psychology, we have procedural memory. Yeah, it's declarative language. memory. You see yes. your hands and that yes. and declarative, which That's is right. things that you can fish out and state. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so in uh, what's that memory? <coughs> memory. Lost. Yeah. Problems around the memory. Yeah. Yeah. But so Alzheimer is really a good example of a almost completely complete dissolution. Or drugs. Yeah, and that's more uh, temporary, right? Whereas Alzheimer, uh, there you have. The, a dissolution of the sense yeah. of self, as in narrative self, because the person has no idea of what he or she is. But that person still functions uh, at the daily level, right? That's why I think uh, it's quite cogent to argue that there is another sense of self which is operating uh, in uh, people who have Alzheimer and that sense of self that is operating is the core self, right? That's a sense of self which is uh, responsible for basic agency in the world. Right? I like that work. I don't like that much story because that sounds kind of superficial, uh, but that's okay. Okay? So, but, but there's a spectrum, right? Yes. From yes. Near depression over becoming a monk and not knowing what you're doing. Down yes. To no, over stopping being a monk. Yes, but I was thinking of things like divorce, for example. Yes, exactly. Or gender gender changes, right? Where you where yes. someone decides that they're not really a man, they're yes. a woman, or yes. vice versa, would be, be disrupted. Yes, and that disruption of narrative, what we call narrative self, right? The self that we construct. Yes, sir. I find it helpful to look at that. Uh, you can look at depression at one at one end of the spectrum. If you, if you use hysteria as the other end, then there's a whole set of psychological problems that fit into that continuum. Okay. Uh, hysteria. Yeah. Well, you have one extreme would be hysteria. Uh, okay. A person who's underbounded. But have, uh, isn't the hysteria more connected with the core self? Uh, in Freudian sense. It's, it's yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by hysteria. Maybe let me continue yeah. and then... Uh, uh, okay, now, what happens when the core self is being disrupted? So, uh, at the light level, this is what some people nowadays call depersonalization syndrome, and they're going to talk about that. At the deeper level, I think schizophrenia, maybe. I don't know if that is what you meant by hysteria, but no. schizophrenia, no, okay, okay. Because schizophrenia is a sense that you're totally losing control of your own mind-body complex, right? That all the thoughts that you get are controlled by other people, come from the outside. So it looks to me, so depersonalization would be the lighter syndrome, and then the whole spectrum which at the far end, something like schizophrenia. When the schizophrenia they're going into number one, because then you're talking about other people bearing witness that. What, 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 what? Your mind stuff going on. What? Here? No, so no, no. If you've got voices and it's, you're not sure it's, your, you're not sure that your voice is your, yourself, or okay. the no. voices are someone else's voices, that's moving into number one. Isn't well, it? Uh, I, that's what some people argue. I actually, no, you, you, like Danza Harvey argues, I actually disagree because I think the person who is schizophrenic still has the minimum self because they are experiencing the voice. They are just not experiencing so the voice. They're not experiencing the voice as their own voice. No, exactly. It's a problem it's of a ownership. Sense, it's the bicameral mind stuff, isn't it? The God is speaking to me. Yes, it's, it's a problem of commenting on my rather than I'm making my yeah. own story as a That's God. why I think it's actually. A problem I would locate here, a problem of ownership 
not a problem of witnessing. Okay, depersonalization. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about depersonalization. The reason I'm talking about that is that <laughs> what I'm interested in thinking about is what is Buddhist uh, practice aiming to deconstruct or aiming to undermine? That's a question which is really, uh, I'm really pursuing it. And what I would want to uh, find out is whether the target of Buddhist practice can be understood in terms of modern cognitive scientific category. And I don't see why they couldn't be understood in both terms. Now, uh, my good friend, uh, 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 what's his name, Mark Sidwitz, think that the target of Buddhist practice is the narrative self. That uh, through Buddhist philosophy, you just deconstruct the self. And therefore, you understand that uh, you're not your own narrative. You're not, your, uh, you're not your own identity, but your own identity is constructed. And therefore, you live a happy life in the present moment. That's his view of the target of Buddhist practice. He's clearly not a Buddhist. What's that? He's clearly not a Buddhist. Then. He's a Buddhist philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> so whether this qualifies a Buddhist or not, I will not <laughs> uh, go into that. You take this with him. Uh, my own view is that it's not just a narrative self, but it's a core self, which is the target of Buddhist practice. So it obviously becomes very interesting. So if this is true, because, OK, I should say why I think that. The reason I think that is probably what you think, which is that m most of the deeper, <coughs> more basic emotion seems to be tied with this core self. And hence, it is this core self that needs to be dealt with in order to be free, right? Fear, desire, all of these things uh, seems to be much more uh, relevant to the core self than the narrative self. So, and in fact, if I look at uh, the question of what kind of self is the target of Buddhist practice, Tibetan sources uh, go seem to confirm what I'm saying. They make a difference between a sense of self which is constructed, intellectually constructed, sorry, and the sense of self which is not intellectually constructed, which is more inborn. Now, I don't think it's necessarily inborn. Could you use the word <coughs> instinctive? I think it's, almost, no, it, almost it's. Almost like an instinct. Yeah, but it starts after a few weeks or a few months of life, right? Yeah. So you're not really born with it, but it comes very quickly. And that's the core self. The narrative self is something you construct through narrativity, through the interaction with other people, and so on. So I think, obviously, both are the target of Buddhist practice. But this one is not enough. Because even if you were able to deconstruct and do the sense of narrative self, that would not bring you freedom from fear and desire, right? Yes? You would say in the Tibetan tradition that the mind-body complex is accepted as a by itself, it's more accepted. No, it's Thus, a... The mind-body complex in the sense of... It's a standard. That, yeah. yeah. So the core self, so the practice is aimed at that also. Yeah. The practice is aimed at deconstructing yes. the core self. It's just the Tibetans. Uh, it's actually only the Vilukpa who ask that question because of the particularity of Tsongkhapa's philosophy. What is the target of Buddhist philosophy? What kind of self? And one of the targets they delineate, it's actually not the deepest one, but it's a core cell, which they describe as the head merchant, the CEO of the uh, mind-body complex. So <laughs> if this is true, then it becomes quite interesting to try to understand what's the difference, or is there a difference, between uh, or, or maybe let's put it this way. What happens when the core self gets disrupted, right? So this is where uh, the person. 
Then I think the right skips the friendly. No, oh, okay. Yes. That's okay, we'll talk about it. I can't spell it. Oh, you can't spell it. Okay, very good. S C H I C O. Spell again. S C H I Z O P H R E N I A. Yeah, so this would be the heavy, the heavy <laughs> end of the what happened to the core cell, right? Depersonalization is, uh, is a much lighter syndrome, and that's what I want to talk a little bit about, because there has been, uh, there, has some, there, there are some interesting research which is happening right now about that. So let's talk about depersonalization. So I'm just going to read a couple of passages which gives you an idea of what depersonalization syndrome is about. As you know, uh, this kind of syndrome, which are uh, listed by the DSM-4, meaning, uh, what's the DSM? The Diagnostic uh, Standard Manual. Manual, right? So this is what people, psychologists use in the US to diagnose people. The category they use are far from being uh, couch in stone, right? They are actually changing between DSM 1 to 4, there are a lot of changes. So we shouldn't take depersonalization syndrome as necessarily a completely coherent category. But it's an interesting uh, problem or pathology which seems to affect the core self. So for us, it's particularly interesting if we want to understand uh, what happens to people in when they uh, do succeed in their own Buddhist practice, right? Is this a so, dissociative disorder? It is one of the dissociative disorders, but the other dissociative disorder, right? So, what they're talking about? Feelings. I want to feel things like everyone else, but I'm dead enough. I can laugh or cry, but it's intellectual. My muscles move, but I don't feel anything. Body, I feel like I'm not here, I'm floating around. A separate part of me is aware of all my movement, it's like I've left my body, even when I'm talking, I don't feel like it is my words. So, what is going on, for example, here, is a difficulty that the person has of owning her body, her words, and so on. So, that's what they call depersonalization syndrome. Some people uh, report that they are outside of their body in a permanent fashion, like a person that uh, uh, was being, is being uh, uh, interviewed by Willoughby Britton reported that that person feels like uh, he or she is 10, centim 10 centimeters to the right of her body. So, and this is a persistent condition, it's not just an out-of-body experience, which happens to a lot of people. It's a persistent condition in which people seem to be deprived from the ability to own their body, their mind, their speech, and so on. So that's what is called depersonalization syndrome. One of the very interesting books which I recommend is uh, this book, uh, Collision with the Infinite, by S Susan Siegel. She was a TM practitioner, uh, and uh, uh, she uh, abandoned TM and then started to experience this deep, uh, having these deep depersonalization syndromes. And then it looks like she was an, a, one of the uh, 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 side of uh, one of the aspects of the, her experience is a lot of fear. <laughs> and uh, so her book here, I really recommend it. This is a, let me read one passage. As I took my place in line, I suddenly felt my ears stood up like they do when the pressure changes inside an airplane as it makes it descent. I felt cut off from the scene before me as if I were enclosed in a bubble, unable to act in any but the most mechanical manner. I lifted my right foot to step up into the past, 
and collided head on with an invisible force that entered my awareness like a silently exploding stick of dynamite, blowing the door of my usual consciousness open and off its hinges, splitting me in two. In the gaping space that appeared, what I had previously called me, was forcefully pushed out of its usual location inside me into a new location that was approximately a foot behind and to the left of my head. I was now behind my body, looking out at the world without using my body's eyes. So the way I analyze this experience is the minimal self is there, right? She has experience, but what she seems to be strongly disrupted is this ability to own her body, right? So out-of-body experience is a differentiated from this? Well, uh, out-of-body experience is a very temporary experience. This is a lasting condition. This, in some people, lasts months, in some people, years. Uh, Willoughby Britton reports that she has a patient who is, after 20 years, still suffering from depersonalization. So this is a pathology. This is not just a, a kind of quaint experience which, you know, you have that experience and then you reintegrate uh, your life, uh, change but fully able to function. Here, uh, it is pathological in as much as people uh, reports uh, very report that this is highly unpleasant. Uh, report that it is really disrupting their life. Though in fact they're not psychotic, they're fully uh, their sense of reality is totally unaltered. They're able to function, but they report that it's really difficult, precisely because they don't own neither their mind nor their body, right? And so, they, so this, she also uh, reports a lot of fear associated with this uh, depersonalization syndrome. <coughs> so, uh, I, so you can see that this raises interesting question as far as Buddhist practice, that is, how different is Buddhist practice from this uh, condition, right? Depersonalization syndrome. That question for me is a theoretical question because I'm a philosopher and I don't do anything practical. So uh, for me, it's purely theoretical. But it actually not. Uh, this is just for me, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with real life. <laughs> so that's why I'm in a university. But that question, that question actually is not purely theoretical. It is a question for Buddhist practitioner, and it is a question uh, that has uh, uh, come to the fore particularly for uh, Will Be Britain because she has uh, she noted in books that a lot of people were suffering from that syndrome as a result of Buddhist practice. And so she has started to collect a number of cases and she has called uh, uh, her project uh, the project of the night cage. Night. Night of the dark soul. <laughs> And this is the project in which she uh, collects all the cases of people uh, who seem to suffer from depersonalization syndrome as a result of Buddhist practice. Now, their case is, is extraordinarily interesting because these people come, come to her after serious Buddhist practice, and <coughs> these people uh, have, uh, have often talked to the teachers and several of the